Welcome to another segment of the Constitution of American Life with Four Bs. Myself, a lover of classic rock, I tend to lean towards uh, Elton John and uh, Billy Joel myself. We have probably one of the foremost experts in music here from the University of Wisconsin, uh, uh, Professor Tim Moore. Uh, his only questionable statement he's ever made to me about music is I think he wants Ry Cooter uh, to have a dedicated shrine uh, uh, to him. Uh, and if you don't know Ry Cooter, Google him, I had to. Uh, there we have Professor Chris Cavanaugh, who believes that the best first date that one can get out there is to take a girl to a Led Zeppelin concert uh, there. So uh, that's something to think about. And of course, Dr. Mike Williams, who believes that the sticks album Kilroy was here was one of the great albums of all time. <laughs> so let me start out by letting you know that we are taping this program, uh, this discussion while I am living in the middle uh, of a bomb cyclone. Uh, so the odds are good that we may have some technical difficulties, uh, given that uh, our internet only works uh, if the uh, you know migrant farm workers pedal the bicycle fast enough uh, for uh, us to get power uh, around here. Uh, yeah, I know the other bees are now shaking their head that I've gotten into trouble uh, there. But uh, uh, again, I live here. I, I can I can make fun of my own. Uh, uh, no, you no, yeah, you I can't. No, you can't. Secondly, we are also uh, having this discussion as I experience a bout of uh, severe depression, given that the Los Angeles Dodgers were denied their God-given inalienable right to compete in another World Series, they lost to the evil Atlanta uh, Braves uh, there. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about political parties. It is important to note that political parties are not a formal part of the United States Constitution uh, and, that they, and that they have evolved uh, over the years, you know, from uh, uh, Federalist uh, Democratic Republicans, and I'll, I'll let the experts fill in the gaps to Whigs and Democrats to 19th century Democrats, Republicans, uh, early 20th century Democrats, Republicans, late 20th century Democrat, Republicans uh, there. So even, even once we get the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, those parties today are nowhere near the parties they were 100 years ago as far as uh, platforms, if both parties actually had a platform, uh, and uh, uh, ideology. Uh, there. Uh, so I would like to note before we get started that uh, parties, in this commentator's opinion, are natural. All right, they just naturally exist, and I think that's reflected in the uh, 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 the works of the framers and uh, uh, their discussion about political structure and political uh, theory. I believe that they are necessary in uh, in our specific system of government built upon factional clash if we look at uh, Federalist Paper number 10. Politics is ugly, it's frustrating, and parties are at the epicenter of politics, but are also part of the natural order of political life. We are going to be dealing today with an observation by Publius in Federalist Paper number one. As he states, to judge from the conduct of opposite parties, they will mutually hope to evince the justice of their opinions and to increase the number of their converts by the loudness and their declamations and by the bitterness of their invectives. Kind of sounds like a debate on CNN. So let's start here We're first with uh, Professor uh, Williams. This is a question I actually grappled with for a number of years and, and kids uh, grappled with. In your opinion, Professor Williams, are political parties factions? as Madison described in Federalist Paper number 10? Yeah, I think they are. <clears throat> I think that what Madison envisioned in Federalist 10, though, were what we might consider to be like maybe one issue political parties. I mean, the, my reading to that is that it's much more narrow, right? And I think that the way political parties have evolved, I think we can talk about this for the purposes of actually getting elected, right, is that they have to become bigger umbrellas. And I think some what i mean by that students is that they have to um they have to form coalitions with a range of different groups in order to get their members elected right um and some parties are bigger umbrellas than others but in terms of collections of individuals who are advancing um an entrance an, an interest or a principle and in this case um to recruit members to get elected then yeah i would say political parties um 
resemble factions. Well, and I want to read for Federalist 10, and, and, and maybe have you build on that a little bit, Professor Williams. It says that it is a, 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 a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens. Yeah. Given that you know, brief uh, uh, articulation that I chose out of Federalist 10, it seems to me that maybe the Republican Party is a faction, but not the Democratic Party. Well, let me think I'm right. Well, I think the Republican Party has a narrow, narrower set of interests, or maybe a narrowly, more narrowly defined passions than the Democrats, maybe. Um, but I, I do want to like, I do want to qualify what I just said, because in political science, um, you know, the way we define political parties as distinct from interest groups, which is another way to think about factions, is that political parties are interested in recruiting candidates and getting them elected into office. An interest group doesn't have, doesn't have that same sort of goal. They're going to lobby for candidates, but they're not necessarily running candidates. That, that division, the actual of running candidates and getting them into office is what political science or what political parties do. So I still think that what Madison is describing can be ascribed to modern day political parties, but it's also in political science, we're much more comfortable thinking about factions as just interest groups. So sorry if I didn't answer your question completely. I just want to make that distinction. No, you did. Um, Professor Kavanaugh. I have a question, Mike, based upon what you said, and I, and I don't necessarily live in the world of political science, but so how would you, given what you just said about interest groups and political parties, um, how would you explain then, say, Senator Sinema or Senator Manchin? Who are seem to be much more uh, beholden yeah. to the the checkbook than to their political party? Yeah. yeah, I guess that's a great that's a great question, Chris. I think that you know from political parties we often think about party systems. Like, what's the like? Is it a two party system, multi party system? And we often think about um, what degree of control do party elites have over their members? So for example, in South Africa, the party elites have a lot of control over their members. Like you vote the way your party leaders tell you to, or you're not on the list of candidates gonna be in office. In the United States, for a variety of reasons, um, largely going back to the F word, <laughs> I think federalism, um, is that we don't, we don't have centralized parties like that. And especially now where raising money is so important, I think you're right on it, Chris. I, I think a lot of members of the Republican and Democratic parties can say thank you very much for this label this helps for me for people to recognize who i'm with but in terms of what i actually want to do i'll go to my interest groups thank you very much because they're paying my bills professor moore any thoughts about that notion because you know especially in the 18th century when when madison talked about factions was he in some way shape or form referencing parties um I don't think so, but I'd like to actually address some more presentism issues, if I might, and I'm, and automatically I'm on shaky ground, and I'm on very <laughs> shaky ground. But I, I couldn't help but think, um, you know, going back a ways, you know, the Democrats seem to me, I, I guess I'd like to push back a little bit on Mike's original statement uh, about political parties, because it seems to me, uh, you know, you go back 20, 30 years, the Democratic Party had environmentalists, um, uh feminists um you know and some of the and labor uh so labor interests are seem to be very different than say environmentalist interests uh the republicans had social conservatives and big business i mean i see those two factions within the republican party as uh very very different in, in their agenda so i i think um i mean mike used with his uh, caveat um use the word you know umbrella so I, I tend to look at it that parties now it seems to me right now everything's off the table although i still think there are factions within the major parties but it does seem to me that there's a big tent umbrella and the trick is trying to keep uh third parties from getting out from under or, or a special interest within the parties getting out from under the tent so i i i, I see our political parties a bit different than just the factional description that Madison had. Uh, Professor Kavanaugh, one yeah. of the first items 
of change or reform that I hear from a number of people uh, is their complaints about the power and influence uh, of parties. And, uh, you know, they say, we got to do something about political parties. But it seems to me that the Supreme Court has made it very difficult for Congress to regulate the influence of parties. In your opinion, was this by design? That is, you know, was that part of, uh, you know, uh, the, the intent of the framers uh, uh, at all? I, I know they didn't put parties in the Constitution, or they didn't really talk about them. Well, but was that, that by design that to keep that, you know, those those political entities outside the Constitution? And do you see it as a flaw? I, I um, no, I don't see it as a flaw at all. And I think you know if you read you, you wonder how much of it is you know jefferson being jefferson you know if i have to go to if i have to belong to a political party to go to heaven then i won't go kind of thing and you know washington poo-pooing parties and and madison to a degree you know poo-pooing parties um i think these guys all wanted to try and demonstrate that a, a certain aloofness are above it all but knowing full well david i would agree with uh, your opening statement the inevitability of political parties right and i don't know if that's that goes along with madison's definition of faction i i tend to think that um there you i tend to think there used to be factions as tim was alluding to within political parties but i don't know that that's the case i think it's much more the case probably with the democratic party because you can see certain progressives trying to hold out right now uh the what they would call moderates i'm not sure about that label but popular presses seem to label some people some moderates but I think within the Republican Party now, there's a great uh, a purity, right? You have to, I mean, they talk about a party purity and you're not allowed to wonder outside of that. If you were outside of that, then you become persona non grata. You're Liz Cheney, you know, you're Adam Kinzinger and you're, you know, you're no longer, you're a rhino or whatever those things are. But I don't think that was a flaw in the constitution, if that's your question, David, uh, by them not including that. Um, I think the, I think the bigger concern is in terms of modern day lack of control, that probably rests with the court. And when you start talking about money and going back to Citizens United and all its progeny and the things leading up to Citizens United in terms of trying to control campaign finance. So I think therein lies the issue. Uh, and if I was going to be upset about the uncontrolled nature of political parties. I might lay that at the feet of uh, of the court. Well, doesn't it, and this is to all of you or whoever wants to jump on it, you're absolutely right. The, the, at the forefront of this is 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 money and, and the money in the parties and, and therefore the power that the parties have over the entire system. Um, but it's it's just not money. It's also monopoly control. And, and that is the way the system is structured and the power that parties have because they're extra constitutional or outside of the constitution in so many ways is they are able to deny in you know significantly any formation of third parties by the state rules or the state party rules that are set up all right isn't that problematical for a system that calls it a democratic republic uh, anybody want to respond or say i'm I'm stupid or or something. Isn't it monopoly power is a problem? Tim? Well, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to address that specifically because <laughs> I'll retreat back to my uh, uh, com comfortable. Uh, how convenient. How convenient. Yeah, no, but I, I do think, um, I don't think Publius One is really addressing political parties, although he uses that word. I think. I would suggest if you read Publius I carefully, it's more of a geographic argument. Uh, you'll, you'll notice, students will notice that in, in Federalist I, there's a fear that these parties are these state yokels that are going to oppose the Constitution. Um, and so there's, there's, this, uh, there's this notion that there's a geographic nature to these things, if we want to call them factions or party. Uh, so so hamilton's laying out this geographic problem that interests are geographic um and i think uh i think to some extent madison may be talking about that too now i think we read madison fed 10 with a modern um with a modern framework 
about national parties, but I, I'm not sure the founders saw national parties as, as the equation. I think they saw them more in a regional, uh, I mean, separate confederacies. Um, and and Publius one kind of addresses that too. You know, I'm going to try to convince New Yorkers that we um, we need a nation, and we can't be divided. And then Federalist two, Jay picks that up. So this, all I'm suggesting is when they're talking about parties, they may be thinking more about geography than they are a, uh, a coalition um, of national interests under a national party. Tim, Tim, just just for clarification. It's, I'm listening to that description. I really appreciate that. It sounds like I, I just keep, I, I keep hearing the word sectionalism in my head, right? And you think about it, yes. you know, as we've taught American history yeah. for years, you know, the sectionalism that's developing in the country. So would you see the pre-Civil War sectionalism? I'm sorry? <laughs> it's before the Constitution. Yeah. So it's just uh, a continuation yeah, of that. Absolutely. And okay. at the convention, there were there was discussion about, you know, three presidents and, and it, you know, they were trying to wrestle with these sectional interests. So my argument is that this geographic thing precedes the Constitution. And, and David, back to your question, um, I think it's it's pretty evident when you get to control the rules. Right. When you when, when we talk about the the not really having third parties or multiple viewpoints, I think that was your question originally um, it, it seems it, i'm just wondering you know i asked you if it was a flaw the way this thing this constitutional development it seemed like it opened up all right the door to monopoly power all right of i guess you could call them if, if they are indeed factions uh and and do you do you agree with me that that one of the problems that developed is this constitutionally protected monopoly power on politics I think that I, we've talked about this before. A guy I mentioned, uh, Duverge, we've talked about this, Duverge's law that whenever you have a first past the post, a winner take all system, the inevitability is that there will only be two parties, right? And so when we've gone through history and we've seen the creation of maybe a third party, like say the Free Soil Party morphing into the Republican Party, right? Or that evolutionary process. Well, 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 wait, 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 wait. We all know it was the Whig Party, not the Free Soilers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't mean to be cute, but there's, there is a, there is a debate as to mommy, mommy, where did the Republican Party come from? And Free Soil is an answer. It's well, legitimate. Well, I mean, answer. consider Lincoln ran, you know, as a Free Soiler and then he ran as a Republican. I'm just going to go out on a limb there with that, so. Uh, but he was a Whig. He was a Whig early in his career, too. Okay. This is what happens, <laughs> kids, when historians get together at dinner parties. <laughs> but the, but my, my, point, my point was that whenever you end up with these two major parties, of course they're going to control the rules. Wait, are you, are you telling it's me? It's like the Yankees like... and Dodgers when you have these two wealthy oh, teams and they shut can. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. Really? Really? Let's see. What two teams are in the World Series? All right, you know, Houston's a relatively, you know, I guess big spender compared to uh, Milwaukee. Anyway, I, don't want to get down teachers, I apologize. But I, do I, I, I guess I need some clarification, and I don't know if Mike's the one to go. Are you telling me that in 19th century England and Canada uh, didn't have first past the post? They have parliamentary systems. And help, help me out, help kids out. So, <laughs> But but for uh, elections of representatives, it's still first past the post, isn't it? I don't know. I, I don't know off the top of my head what system Canada uses, so I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. Well, I'm getting what, what what Chris says is when you have first past the post, it's obviously going to be a two party system. Yes, that that begs the question then: is all these other democratic republics yeah. out there historically? Are you telling me that none of them had first past the post system? No, well, they, they do, but because they're parliamentary systems and not presidential systems, right? Their parliamentary systems would allow for multiple viewpoints to come in and for multiple parties, because traditionally you're going to have, and we see this all the time in modern governments, right? We see it um, happening in Israel right now. If you have to form a coalition, right, to actually form a government, 
whether it's in Canada, whether it's in Israel or other places. So when a parliamentary system, it does allow life for third parties, for, for fourth parties, where I, you're going to. Well, I, I mean, I, I always think of that as two separate design questions. So the first one is, uh, are you going to have a presidential system or a parliamentary system, which for students just means presidential systems by, de by definition, um, individual voters or voters through an electoral college vote for the head of state, head of government. Parliamentary systems allow the majority party to come up with that person, right? And parliamentary systems can have first past the post. Now, what we find globally is that, first of all, first past the post is, is not, it's a minority of countries that use first past the post. And in most cases, countries that use first past the post are presidential systems. But it doesn't mean that the parliamentary system can't do it, right? It just means that the design is that most of them don't. And what the students should realize with this issue is that this is up to the states. I mean, states can decide tomorrow. Your state could decide tomorrow whether it's first past the post or whether it's PR. Um, but because of the power of the two-party system, as Chris was getting to, it became within the interest of those elites to keep it as a two-party system. But it doesn't have to stay that way, not at all. So, Tim, um, and, and I'm, I'm going to cross. I'm going to cross the beams of presentism and, and history here. Uh, and I, today's political buzzword is polarization. You know, it's just all over the place, and and that's the key word uh, these days. But it seems to me, in reading Publius One, that that seems to be exactly what they're describing. That polarization is the natural order that our whole system is kind of based in some ways and you your insight is it's more regional or geographic polarization uh to some degree uh so is this idea of polarization today based upon what the framers created in the 18th century is it, is it inherently bad or dangerous i would say i would say no um in the theoretical now, now how it works out on the ground uh that's up for, that's up for grabs um but I, I mean i can't believe that the 1850s there was a consensus about much um i so and there certainly wasn't a consensus um in the as the 1790s progressed there was tremendous uh polar domestic and foreign policies so I think uh, polarization, I think, is 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 a um, um, I think some people pining for the good old days that in my mind never existed. That that's how I would answer. And and also I think to back to my I, I really want to drive this geography thing in the ground here. I, I mean, political parties always want to be because our system is this binary system, you know, party A, party B. Federalist, anti-federalist. Um, you know, it, it, the Republican Party had a Dickens of a time figuring out how to become a national party because, uh, to Chris's point, there's what is the Republican Party at its birth? It's a regional, northern, uh, and maybe just a midwestern party. And so they have to figure out a way to become a national party in the in this the Reconstruction and and. Uh, uh, allows them to become a national party with a whole new um, block of enfranchised voters. So parties, I think, there's always a geographic nature, I think, to our parties in our in our history before they become national entities. Right, and it's about getting traction, right? I mean, you think about the, the think about the you know um, populist party. You know, and then yep. getting absorbed into the 1896 Democratic platform, um, yep. you know, that kind of, you know, um, gosh, uh, cross, cross of gold speech. Help me out. Um, Je uh, Brian Jennings, Brian, yeah, well, yeah, Jennings, 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 Brian, you know, trying to uh, trying to take these ideas from them. But Tim, I'm going to push back just a little bit on that. The polarization. I absolutely agree. I mean, we can go through from the 1960s backward. Right. And even more modern to show the polarization, but we were still able to do things. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, we were able to get people confirmed to positions, you know, to fill out positions within the government, whether it be the courts or whether it be the bureaucracy. 
we've we've always usually been able to do things and now i think the that polarization that we face right now has gotten into the day-to-day -day kind of you know tug polarization and, and you know case in point might be vaccines you know and you know trying to get people vaccinated in a pandemic that's killed over seven hundred thousand americans and we still have people you know trying to stop that and it's like why why has politics entered into this so we've had these divisions and they've been ugly throughout history but I think we're at a, I'm not sure I don't want to say you know yeah. worst time but it's, it's we seem to struggle with basic would stuff you, now. would you concede that polarization occurs on certain issues but there is there might be consensus on others I mean, for example, it's interesting to me when I look at this infrastructure bill, there seems to be uh, some agreement on that. Now they're, they're arguing over how to define infrastructure, whether it's physical or, or social infrastructure, but on vaccines, certainly. So, so I wonder if polarization is, uh, is highlighted a lot over specific issues now, whereas there actually might be consensus on certain issues. Well, I don't know. Well, think about the think about um, the the showdown with the debt ceiling and spending we just had, right? Right. So it seems like we've got one political party right now that is willing for whatever possible small gain they can get, they're willing to have the nation default on loans and drive up unemployment to put us in a much more difficult spot. I would think that in the past we could say we could argue about policy, but we would get to a certain point and say, "Hey, this is we need to have this done for the nation, and people will come together, right?" Yeah. So, and and I think now we we I don't know. I just see us struggling more with that. Mike, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I, I did. I just want the students to. I think all this is right on. I think the students. A couple of things I want to highlight. Um, first of all, to Tim's point about the difficulty of becoming a national party in the American context. And he, he mentioned Reconstruction. I just want to remind students what that meant. <laughs> it meant that there was a military occupation of the South. It meant that the other political party was basically put out of business for about five, 10 years. And Republicans were able then to, because of the 13th Amendment, right, and the 15th Amendment, there was a whole group of new voters who were going to vote for the Republicans. So that national sort of identity came out of a military occupation which I just think is interesting to think about how change yeah. happens in America. Um, the second point I just want to raise is I, I think that most of the data would say that there's always been polarization. And maybe it's, it's been really intense around race in this country. But to Chris's point, the polarization in the public, when people got to the government, they got things done, right? They were able to get things done. In the 1990s, we see that changing. And I think we see increasing polarization since the 1990s. And I would just have students think about the effect of the United States becoming the superpower in the world versus one of two superpowers in the world. And what that means is I think there's a little more flexibility for our political parties to kind of say, we don't have to worry about what the Soviets are thinking. There's not a security risk for us just kind of going after each other in a way that during the Cold War wasn't going to wasn't going to be as seemly. Um, and as that begins to change in this century, as we begin to face, you know, our next rival, uh, whether it's China or someone else, that politics might have to then adjust itself. I, I, I just do think there's an external factor here that students should be thinking about. Hey, David, welcome back. We missed you. Well, you, and, you know, given and I'm not trying to like hijack anything, but given the current news we have in the last few days about facebook and how their algorithms work and you talk about you know it used to be you could look at the the majority of americans were usually in the bulk, the voters were the bulk were in the middle you know some were a little left socially conservative uh, excuse me socially liberal um you know maybe a little fiscally conservative and you know, you know, most people were somewhere in the middle. They didn't deviate too much, but we've seen over the last, um, you know, ten to twelve years, we start to see this division. You know, probably going back to the '90s, even Mike, to start to see the public now 
being more divided. And I think that what we've seen about Facebook here in the last few days and how their algorithms actually help drive that division, um, I think that's something for students to think about as well. Um, because well, I'm so, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I, I think that's a great insight there, Chris. And so it seems to me that what you're saying, and, and it reinforces what we started with, parties are just natural and they are a reflection of of the people and the culture. So I am curious, you know, kind of, and Mike, you kind of touched on this question already because I was going to ask you to uh, elaborate a little bit on international comparisons of parties, but you've, you've kind of done that. I am curious then to all three of you, are our parties, because of the structure of our government, therefore more cultural, you know, cultural expressions of geography or whatever, rather than ideological? Seems to me in parliamentary system, the parties are ideological and policy oriented. Our parties don't seem to be, and, and I point out that the, the current Republican Party has no platform of policies. Their platform is either you are with Trump or against Trump. All right. And that definitely seems more cultural. So in the broader scope, I'm just wondering, is that where America separates itself from the rest of the world? Is that our parties are much, much more of a cultural reflection? whether that's geography, race, class, or whatever, rather than ideological. Um, I'll, I'll jump on that grenade. Um, I, I think yes, because you know people always ask this question, how, how is it, because we know that pocketbook issues really tend to drive people to the polls, right? Those kitchen table issues. Well, uh... no? Well we, well, we like to think that, right? We like to think that. But here's yes. the problem, and uh, yes, let me clarify. Thanks, Tim. Um, is that we are, we ask this question: Why do people continually vote against their own economic interests? And I think part of that goes back to David's point: is because people are able to stoke these culture culture wars, yep. with the help of social media, to actually get people to think it's in their best interests to. Um, allow the very, very wealthy people to hold on to a lot more of their money um, as opposed to, you know, paying maybe more in taxes or is somehow that unions are bad and allowing government policies to break up the unions, which we know has helped destroy the middle class. So I would say, yeah, the identification politics right now, cultural might be more so than ideological. Gentlemen, Tim, did you freeze? Yeah, I think he's frozen. Okay. Would you agree with that, though, Mike? That this cultural is more than ide ideological. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that it's all. I think that um, in that race to get this um, this median voter, I think our political parties have always been um offered less drastic policy options than you might find in other countries where there was a clear sort of social democratic view of the world and a more neoliberal sort of view in terms of policy. Like our, our populace is just much more in the middle for a long time. So I think it's been a, a target of that. So I think the parties naturally have kind of come to the middle. And I think now, despite this growing income inequality, and despite the fact that there are large segments of our population demanding different policy sort of prescriptions, I think the reality is um, where the parties have to go for money and knowing who actually votes <laughs> means that what they can do then, we know that people who have money vote. People who have money vote, right? So the Democrats are going after people who have money, who share their values, whether those are cultural values or economic values, and the Republicans are doing the same thing, right? So they don't have to offer um, that innovative of policy prescriptions because policy-wise, the rich folks kind of want the same thing. I mean, I guess the progressive rich folks are a little more healthy, a little more open to being taxed, right? But for the most part, they're gonna agree on the policy stuff. But the Democrats and Republicans are both going after their donations. So I think that they go after that based on the, the value cues that they can give them. 
I guess I'd like to uh, pose a question about um, whether whether we think political parties today undermine our nation's first principles, um, whatever those might be. I mean, do 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 they reinforce or undermine our our founding principles? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, what what say we on that? Well. I guess we would have to probably get a consensus on first principles. Uh, well, that, that's where you get to def you get to define the term. Well, I, no, I you know, well I shouldn't be the one to define them, but uh, you know, uh, you know, if indeed what I mentioned before that the whole premise, if we look at Federalist Fifty One, is and Federalist Thirty Nine and Federalist Ten, there's a consistent theme going on here, is because of the nature of our 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 culture and therefore our political culture our size our diversity if it seems to me a theme is you know uh, uh, ambition versus ambition there that uh, uh and therefore checks and balances separation of powers federalism all these things going on the parties generally fit into that they're informal they're not you know part of the constitutional arrangement but uh, it seems to me the whole system was designed, you know, again, and you guys talk about, you know, how they poo pooed parties being bad. But the fact is, they were well aware they were going to exist. And that in many ways, maybe they were designing the system to deal with those, whether they're factions or parties, and the pressure they would put on the system uh, there. So it seems to me, they would be consistent with the constitutional structure and first principles there because obviously you know, as far as interest goes and passion goes uh, and we see that very much today uh, even though to some of it's kind of wacky but when you're presenting vaccination policy as a give me liberty or give me death kind of proposition uh you know so they're arguing over a first principle of liberty they're arguing over a first principle today of federalism and national versus state power they're arguing over you know, uh, too much power in the executive, the same thing they were arguing about in the 18th century. So I would say that parties fit in uh, perfectly with our first principles uh, and our constitutional arrangement. That's my view. Chris? Um, just, I, I don't disagree with what you said, David. I think that's, that was well said. But I would throw in one more first principle, and that's the rule of law. You know, we like to teach our students, you know, that we're a nation of laws and not men, you know, the Adams quote. And, back to pain and uh, in our nation, the law is king kind of thing. And I think both parties have been guilty of this in terms of holding people accountable for breaking that law, especially at the national level when there's a political interest. We, we seem to lose the ability to uphold that principle of the rule of law when there is a, 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 um, a lack of political will or a lack of political momentum. It was clear that you know there should be some people that were held accountable for the torture program, but we did not hold anybody accountable for the torture program. It's clear we should have held people accountable for wrecking our economy in the recession of 2008, 2009. No one was held accountable. Why is that? We tried to impeach a president that, by all, you know, we impe impeached him twice, but the first time, by all accounts if you looked at the evidence it was clear but we we don't have that political will and now if you look at the january 6th committee trying to hold people accountable for a coup there's no other way to put it as more and more evidence comes out this was an organized attempt to overthrow the election who will be held accountable politically for that can i ask you chris as compared to what can you give me an example in the in the, in the in the global community of a nation that does better in accountability? China. <laughs> well, I guess you're right on that one. Can let's narrow it down then to you know, those that fall into the realm of of democratic type society. Oh, sorry, you didn't say that. My my Canadian side of the family is rather upset because they don't believe there's much accountability for the prime minister in Canada right now. Uh, he's embroiled in a number of controversies. There. But he was so, still reelected. So, uh, well, and we have re we have elections. 
And so the yeah. accountability was that Trump wasn't reelected. I'd like right? to put, uh, well, Mike, 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 I think Mike was going to yeah, jump Yeah, Mike, Mike uh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead, Tim. I'll go after you. Well, just real quickly, um, I've often, I guess I've, I've wondered, I think maybe national parties are kind of like the filtering process that Madison is so keen on. I mean, he creates a system that filters a lot of different interests and uh, the structure is designed to do that. So I think if party, national parties, if they have factions within them, that national party kind of has to figure out how to sift and winnow. So, so maybe um, the not so much the issues. We I think we've been talking about particular issues, founding principles. But if sifting and winnowing is a founding structural principle, I think national parties might do that, assuming they have factions in them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to get back. I mean, Chris's point about January six. I. I mean. The political elite, I hear I'm on shaky ground because I'm going to go to the 1780s, Tim. I'm on very shaky ground, right? I, I think here's what I want to say to the students. Um, political elites play a crucial role in, in new governments, right? Their values and their behaviors matter because what they do sets up institutions that all of a sudden get their own inertia, right? We have a two-party system because of a certain inertia that elites provided us with hundreds of years ago. And it seems to me that um, our political elites at the founding, while definitely not perfect, I think believed in the common good. Um, and they believed in a, at least a limited amount of participation that was going to be legitimate, that was going to, they were going to be held account, right? They were going to get their seats in the House because they got the votes. And they were going to get to the Senate because the, the state assemblies got them there, right? That legitimacy of the electoral process is so different than what we're seeing today, which I think is really just interesting for the students to think about. The general fact that we don't trust the electoral system is, as Chris is saying, a really big deal. And given that our political elites are not trying to tamper that down, but they're actually feeding it, is really, really interesting. Because the point I really wanted to go with is I was just thinking about uh, African countries that I study. And in brand new countries in Africa, without any rules on political parties, what you got a lot of times are like um, cult of personality parties, right? You got patron client relationships. And what's really interesting to me, and I don't have the answer to this, I bet Tim and Chris and Dave do, how it would have been so easy for the United States, for our political elites to create those cults of personality, right? And instead, we end up 30 years after our founders are largely left this earth, we have institutionalized parties that are then controlling political conflicts without extensive use of political violence. And for most parts of the world that are developing new democracies and are trying to institute political parties, that is not the experience. So in this case, maybe there is some American exceptionalism. <laughs> um, it, it wouldn't be the way if I were counseling other countries on how to create political parties, I wouldn't say do what the United States did because it was pretty much like hands off, let's just kind of see what happens. And it could have gone in such a bad, different direction. And it's fascinating to me that it didn't. So, sorry, that I took too much Well, time. there's a, yeah. no, 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 no. I, I, that's a great point about cult of personality. There's a book written a, a while back by Joanne Freeman um, about the early, early Republican political parties. And she, one of the arguments she makes in this book, Affairs of Honor, is that uh, a lot of people in the first Congress are taking their cues from the political elites. And taking their cues from the political eats, elites in the 90s was the origins of our, of our political party. So, uh, so I think to your point, Mike, that uh, actually in America, there may be some um, cult of personality uh, surrounding parties. You know, uh, Jackson, I think there's a lot of cult of personality in in that era uh, in the Democratic Party. So and now I think, um, you know, the, the notion that Trump is basically uh, the party for the Republicans, uh, that that argument has been made. So I think there is something to that cult of personality point that you made, Mike, even in our in our context. So, Chris, 
the kids are asked to look at the advantages and disadvantages of, of parties uh, there. In your opinion, doesn't the positive heavily outweigh the negative? Because in the last analysis, we cannot function as a political society, as a constitution, in our constitutional arrangement, I don't know if there's any country that can function without parties. So doesn't the positive heavily outweigh the negative when it comes to uh, parties? I don't know if I would use the word heavily, but I do think there are positives to be sure, right? And and most of the students that watch this, hopefully you can get your hands on a good government textbook or a perhaps an AP government textbook, you know, and, and go to the chapter. It will list all the things that political parties do, organize elections, put up candidates. Mike alluded to that earlier, right? So there are a whole list of very positive things that Dave is re referring to. And I would say that and I'm going to go back to your original statement, David, of the inevitability of political parties, much like Madison said, there's an inevitability of faction. And I agree with both of those. I don't think that uh, factions are necessarily political parties. Um, so I think that there is a positive there. Heavily outweigh? I don't know. I, I think we go back to some of the issues that we've already cited in terms of where we are. And it may actually be human nature that is the issue right those that have power want to hold on to that power and they're willing to do what they need to to hold on to that power um and so therein lies the political party the the negative side of the political party so i would say the positives outweigh the negatives i'm not sure if they heavily outweigh them mike or tim thoughts about that go ahead mike um i think i agree with chris that's a good question um this is a really good question i the, the problem is, is it's my own lack of imagination or it's my knowing my lack of imagination of what democratic politics looks like without political parties the examples that i tend to have on that they're they don't end up being democratic politics right the no political party system like in uganda was completely a party system it was just like the leader is telling people to be in one party. So it wasn't, it wasn't a no party system. I, I think that, I think what we're missing in the United States, the why, why I'd agree with Chris about how it is advantageous, but not heavily so, is that the thing for political parties is that when we live in these big diverse countries, political parties are supposed to give voters cues. Like it's supposed to be like, if you wanna be on this team, here are the values and the things we'll do if we get power, right? and get us in the office so we can do this stuff. And I think what's frustrating with the way our political parties work is that, or the way the government works when the political parties get there, is that voters never see those preferences put in the policy, right? You know what I mean? So it's like you vote for the Republicans to go do X, Y, and Z, but the Republicans can't do it. And all they're doing is pointing fingers at, at each other, right? And I think, I just heard something on the news yesterday, right, about this race in Virginia. And the Democrats are really concerned that, that voters are just tired. They're tired of being told that this is the most important election of their lives. They're tired of being told that everything is going to change. And I heard an NPR, they're, they're interviewing Democratic Democrats who are saying, I don't think I'm going to vote because what does it matter? Like, in the end, no one does anything different. We get the same policies, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. While I don't agree with that, I think it is, in terms of the health of our democracy, I think we benefit from citizens experimenting with what it's really like under a Republican policy <laughs> platform, whatever that is, and what it's like under a Democratic, Republican, uh, Democratic platform. And we don't see that currently. And I think it means that people then just don't trust the parties. Well. Professor Moore, let me ask you this again, and in, in your stance of non-presentism is rather squishy, to be quite honest. You you move into presentism when with you know <laughs> when you feel like it uh, there, yes. but uh, it's like the political, like the Supreme Court and the political question. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good observation. We'd be talking about uh, the court here in our uh, one of our next sessions uh, there, but. I guess from a historical point of view and a man who lives in the 21st century, it seems to me that I'm wondering to what degree you feel that party, the party structure has changed in, in that, you know, is it highly centralized? 
are uh, have the two parties taken a different path in that sense because there used to be some major differences between the, the local party the state party and the national party which as you said kind of reinforced madison's you know filter system is that the national party had to do a lot of filtering with all these local and state entities there is 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 that still true today do you think based upon your observations and you do live in wisconsin uh, well i don't like i don't think it is right yeah i don't think it is just uh from from my point of view now what why that happened i i'm less certain of. i i know there's this thesis that in the 70s when uh there were some changes that took place in the democratic party first uh where the party had less control over um individuals if they ran within the democratic party so i think uh so i think that decentralization started you know 40 50 years ago and you don't if i'm a, a a person that wants to run within a um political party i can fundraise separate from that party and i'm less tethered to that party so it seems to me and maybe maybe uh, uh mike can speak to this more directly about the structural changes that took place to decentralize power and control within our major parties yeah um yeah are you referring to the primary primaries right right well but even after that now right yeah i mean yeah, yeah students are our political parties got too democratic too fast and they lost control i mean the, the things that we sort of would do not like about backroom politics with a bunch of mostly white males is is what sustained a certain predictability and sustainability of the political system and once you open that in the 1970s along with buckley v vallejo and all of a sudden now um there's no limits on the or li very limited limits on campaign finance it's like you get this this uh environment where it's hard for political elites to hold those in their party accountable well i'm curious you know, I, I have a sense where i know where chris is on this but mike i'm is that true of today's republican party and and, and we ought to be upfront and honest here i mean the republican party of 2021 is not the republican party of 2012. yeah now it's changed drastically and it seems to me that the republican party has become highly centralized that uh, if you at a local level all right defy you know the the cult of personality that now exists you're going to get destroyed and i think liz cheney is a is a prime example of that i would i would disagree a little bit i think that the the political the republican political elites the mitch mcconnell's i think they've co-opted this energy i think mitch mcconnell would be just as happy being a compromiser and getting things done but that's not where the votes are i mean right. this this to me starts with well i don't know where it starts you see it getting amped up after after obama's election you see it with the tea party movement and yep. you see the republican party thinking holy mackerel what is happening what is happening to us and the Democrats with these people coming out now and shouting us down, and now they're running primary candidates against us? We better get in control of this. So you have yeah. people who I think very shrewdly incorporated that energy into the party. And then what we see with Trump is another manifestation of we don't like being in the party, do more. And I think that I think that polit the political elites are using that energy i don't think they necessarily care about it i really don't i think some do i think they're just doing it because that's where the votes are and well the, you're trying to get into psychology now and read their minds but the end no result no no is, populism no i agree with mike on this populism is real populism is very real and the republicans have figured that out and they're willing to ride that that pony fine but that but the end result is still the same the end result is the republican party has become highly centralized well whatever that that in, but, in the, and the democratic right party now, it doesn't mean anything and the dem it, what do you mean it doesn't mean anything because i think mike's right they're they know where their count they know where the votes are and it's a populist wave and they're willing to ride that ride that train you know what scares the bejesus out of me is uh the 1930 weimar republic because when you allow a fringe group to come in 
and strikes that populist nerve that Tim was just alluding to, right, and creates a stir. And then you have the elite saying, hmm, maybe we've got something here, but we can control this guy yeah. until they can't. Well, but it's not just Trump. I mean, John Stewart himself has said that in the last couple of weeks. It's not just Trump. There's a real populist, and there's a populism on the left, too. I, I, uh, I, yes. Go ahead, Mike. I think, I mean, you're making a good point, Dave, but I do think if we saw the centralized Republican Party, as you just kind of hinted that we have, we don't get this from John McCain. And we have Obamacare completely repealed. No, I mean, you... Maybe it's, maybe it's the exception of one, but like if you if it was as centralized as you're saying, that would not have been allowed to happen. That doesn't happen in other centralized political systems. Politics has the shelf life of a gnat. That that was that was a thousand years year ago kind of thing. The, the party has changed because McCain, you know, is abolished in the party. You know, you can't find many Republicans who'll stand up and say, I admire John McCain. He's dead to the party. You so I'm be. talking about you're right at that moment. But today, you're not going to find anybody in the House or the Senate to do that because the two that have tried, all right, I've been banished. No, there's well, there's still there's still no. there's still 10, 12 folks in the House that are, are willing to uh, to do the uh, McCain equivalent of a thumbs down. I mean. Um, I mean, this how this this January six things will play out. We'll, we'll see if there's more and more people that'll go thumbs down like McCain. So I guess I'm um, I don't get all uh, lathered uh, up. I, I have a tendency to not get lathered up, hyperventilated, or I whatever, thought you were saying apoplectic. <laughs> apoplectic. There. <we> go. <laughs> uh, so I mean, it, it's hard to tell right now. I mean, you might be right that there's a uniformity but uh i'm willing to suggest that there's enough rumbling out there that that may uh that may be symptomatic of not a unified field theory of politics well let's let's deal with that that rumbling all right because and you brought up I, you brought up something i thought was very important tim especially about you know the 18th and especially 19th century that the interest that madison was talking about was geographic which in many ways helped to form and structure our political parties uh, into our lifetime, you know, uh, in many ways uh, uh, there. Uh, so a lot of academics believe we're coming up to another period of what is called party realignment, uh, of which I, you know, and I don't know how many to count. I think I've got four periods of realignment. What's really interesting about what's going on now, Professor Moore, is especially within the well in both parties but especially within the republican party these interests and passions are not geographic all right I, you know they they are all over the place they're in all 50 states so does that to you trigger the sense that we are going to go through another within the next 10 15 years another party realignment uh could be man you're asking a presentism question and a crystal ball question so that's that's a tough one um, i started off with you because i knew the answer would be short <laughs> i will i will defer i mean I, I don't know will the republican party become a south a southern party i mean there's some people that think that. i don't think that but uh i don't know i'll defer to chris and, and mike on that one chris uh what's the question or is regionalism <laughs> is regionalism out the window well are we are you do you think given this the status of american politics today that we are coming up and again i've read so many different op-eds and journal articles that we're heading into a, a an era and i think you've read there are some major old world republicans old world as five years ago <laughs> who are arguing that Republicans either vote for Democrats or Republicans form, like in Utah, a third party there. Right. Do you see on the on, on the near horizon a party realignment? Well, I think it's it's going to be extremely difficult because of many of the things we've already talked about. And the primary thing is money. And where you have these big donors are going to give money to people they believe will be elected. I mean, some of the big donors will give money to both the Democrats and Republicans. And so for, a, say, a 
a group to break away from the Republican Party, right? And, and to, to, to pull the, as you call them, the old world Republicans with them. I think, you know, they're going to be, there's going to be a lot of temperature taking, a lot of toe dipping in the water. And people are going to have to, uh, you know, to, to jump in there. Who is it? Somebody was on one of the Sunday morning talk shows and was asked a question simply to repudiate a statement made by, uh, I think, uh, former President Trump and would not do it. And this was an older uh, Republican senator. I, I don't know the complete context, but he, he, he wouldn't repudiate that for fear of the backlash that would come at him, whether that would be he would be no longer welcome, he'd be an outcast, uh, whatever it may be. So I don't know that we're, we're ready for that now. I don't think that we're ready for a realignment. Well, and, and again, students, when we talk about party realignment, we've had these moments in history. Uh, uh, our call, my colleagues have already talked about this. You know, one was the death of the Whig Party uh, and the rise of the Republican Party, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s, and Lincoln there. We also see a party realignment uh, during the late 20s, early 30s, the New Deal realignment and what is called the New Deal Coalition, which ultimately fractures, and we see in many ways a realignment in the 70s and 80s, especially within the South. And as Tim has mentioned before, with what used to be called labor Democrats uh, have now in large numbers moved to the Republican Party. So the question is, are we going to see this? I mean, what, a, what part of what I envision is so-called, and I know Chris doesn't necessarily accept this, moderate Republicans or, you know, or, or never Trumper Republicans aligning with those who are in the uh, category with cinema and mansion and creating a new party, the party of the middle. And then you've got these others, which might be more out in the extreme. I mean, part of me can, can see that happening because I already see that being called for, especially by more moderate Republicans. So Mike, you're the political scientist. I'll let you wrap this up as far as this notion of political realignment and let you look at your crystal ball and what do you think is uh, on the horizon? Yes, it's gonna happen in 2036. Take it to the bank. <laughs> is, that, is that the Bitcoin bank, Bitcoin, or what, what bank should I take it to? <laughs> I've got DraftKings or something, I don't know. Um, um, no, I, seriously. I mean, I just want to, for the students, I just want to emphasize, like, party realignments, they're the result of, like, gradual shifting, a gradual shift that's happened over time, but there is a disruptive moment, right? So it's the, it's the, it's the, we're on the verge of a civil war. It's, we're in a great economic depression. And I would argue, I'm going to start calling it the beginning of the fourth republic, because I'm going back to the articles of the first, the say, I'm, in 1965, right, we have the beginning of the Fourth Republic, and I think we've seen a, a realignment out of the consequences of those decisions. So, so what we, I can't predict how the realignment's going to happen, but I do know it's going to take that kind of event. And when I look, when I get into my crystal ball as much as I should as a political scientist, here's what I, what I would have the students think about. Um, I guess it's three or four things. The, demog the, the demographic shifts that are happening in this country are gonna be really felt in the next 20 years. So our country is going to look much different than it's ever looked in its history. And I think that's gonna have political ramifications for the parties. I think in the next 20 years, we're gonna have a very clear sense that we are a superpower in decline. And I think how the political parties react to a rising China is gonna affect our domestic politics. Um, third, I think that it, um, our Supreme Court is set up for about a 20 to 25 year rule. And a lot of the things that we are used to as being the rules in society are gonna change. And I think that that ship has sailed no matter what Chief Roberts or others wanna do. I think that's gonna have an enormous impact in terms of the way people think about what they should be doing at the ballot box. So I'm not sure how those three things, if they're gonna happen or if they're gonna to happen together, but those are, I think, are big shifts that we can see on the horizon. And I think that the, it's going to take a moment like that to where um, 
the people are going to say, wait a minute, why are we still voting for X party or Y party? We should have Z or let's get rid of X completely. Um, who knows how that will end up? But I, I do think I do think in the next 20 years, we're going to see something happen. Yeah. Well, students and teachers and uh, those just interested in the American Constitution, I don't think there's a better way to wrap this up. And it took the political scientist to give us focus and uh, uh, you know uh, stability in this uh, conversation. So nice job, uh, youngster. Uh, I love the sticks, uh, Williams uh, there. Uh, so in our next session, we're going to be talking about the Electoral College, which is, again, one of those issues at the center of our uh, current political uh, discussion and narrative. Uh, until then, uh, hopefully you uh, have learned something about political parties uh, from this session. We'll see you next time. Same bat place, same bat uh, time. Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.